Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Emily Hopin Squaxt, Wa'ach or Elpstwin the Kamloops Art Gallery. My name is Emily Hope. I'm the Education and Public Programs Director here at the Kamloops Art Gallery. Before we begin our program today, I'd like to take a moment to situate ourselves. The concept of here is somewhat abstract in these virtual gatherings, but for myself and those of you joining us from the regions surrounding the gallery, here is to come up some kutluh. I introduced myself in Sukhutmichin because that is the language of this land. Who we refer to as Kamloops and beyond, spanning over 180,000 square kilometers across the interior plateau of what we call British Columbia, is Sukhutm Utluk, the territory of the Sukhutm people. It is an immense privilege to be a guest on these lands, and I am so grateful to my teachers, Jessica Arnous and Sunny Prairie Chicken, for continuing to make space for me in their classrooms, for their generosity, guidance, and patience. Yeet Skukstechem. I'm joined today by art historian Victoria Nolte, along with the folks from Collective Broadcast who are managing the tech in the background. Our program will be about an hour in duration, including some time at the end for questions and conversation. You can submit your questions throughout the talk using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and you're also welcome to chat amongst yourselves and with us through the chat window. I'll begin by sharing a brief biography to introduce you to Jin Mi Yoon and her work, followed by a short introduction to Victoria. Jin Mi Yoon is a Korean-born, Vancouver-based artist. Since the early 1990s, her lens-based practice has critically examined the construction of self and other in relation to her own direct and inherited history, as well as within broader geopolitical contexts. Unpacking stereotypical assumptions and dominant discourses, Yoon's work has examined gender and sexuality, culture and ethnicity, citizenship and nationhood. Adopting a wider and wider lens over time, her practice has become a deep investigation into entangled local and global histories existing at specific sites within the context of transnationalism. Jin mi is the recipient of many awards, most recently the 2022 Scotiabank Photography Award. Here Elsewhere Other Hauntings is the first retrospective de dedicated to the work of Jin mi -Yun. Curated by Anne-Marie saint jean Oppre and organized by the Musée d'Art de Joliette, Quebec, this exhibition brings together nearly 30 years of Yoon's artistic practice through a thematic journey. It shares works that condense several of the artist's preoccupations, including her relationship with her Korean heritage, her experience of migration, and her testing of the reality of, of what are considered Canadian ideals. Victoria Nolte is an art historian and doctoral candidate in the Interdisciplinary Cultural Mediations Program at Carleton University. Her doctoral work focuses on the visual cultures of Asian diasporas in North America, examining issues of site responsiveness, historical representation, and practices of world making and installation and media works by Asian Canadian artists. Broadly, her research focuses on two streams, on the collection, exhibition, and study of Asian art in Canada, and on rethinking global migration, both forced and voluntary, as an integral part of the story and construction of Canadian art. She is currently managing editor for the journal Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures and the Americas and a contract instructor for the School of Studies in Art and Culture at, Car at Carleton University. Please join me in welcoming Victoria Nolte. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Emily, for the introduction and also for situating us and giving a really really great uh, overview of Jin Mi's work and her preoccupations over the past 30 years. Um, I will I, I will jump into my prepared talk for today. I'm just going to <laughs> start sharing my screen. Okay. All right. Something. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, hello, everybody. I'm grateful to be speaking to you this afternoon from traditional and unceded Algonquin territory, situated along the banks of the Kitchissippi or Great River. Um, it is here where I have had the pleasure to live, work, and think alongside a vibrant community of artists, activists, and scholars, both at Carleton University and beyond. Before I begin my talk, I wanted to provide a brief background about my own relationship to Jin Mi Yoon and her work. I've known Jin Mi for close to a decade. 
Um, I met her when I was writing my master's thesis, which focused on her video series, As It Is Becoming. As a younger scholar, I'm deeply appreciative of Jinny's generosity and her brilliance. Her work has inspired me over the years to think critically about the expansive capacities of lens-based media, especially how the camera can be used to bring about an embodied sense of world making and being in the world. I should also mention that some of today's talk is related to research I have completed on a number of Jinny's recent video works, um, and it's going to be published in a paper forthcoming with the journal Verge Studies in Global Asias. Okay. The thematic and non-chronological organization of the current exhibition at, in Kamloops, um, which brings together nearly 30 years of Jinmi Yoon's lens-based art practice, inspired me to think through, the spe through a specific concern that has emerged throughout her expansive career. That is the concern with time, how it is lived and experienced versus how it is structured by chronologies of capitalism and colonialism, which are conditioned by narratives of relentless progress. In her forthcoming book published by Art Canada Institute, art historian Ming Tianpo notes how time figures into Jin, Jin Myun's work in a number of ways, encompassing subject matter, medium, scale, and philosoph philosophical inquiry. Indeed, throughout Yoon's works, we can unpack ways of experiencing time through family, through historical consciousness, and through the environment that are reliant upon each other and that point to ways of relating beyond structures of colonial modernity. So in the spirit of resisting chronology, I would like to start with Yoon's most recent work in the exhibition, Dreaming Birds Know No Borders. This experimental video connects places on both sides of the Pacific Ocean, moving between footage shot on the traditional unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation and at the border that divides the Korean Peninsula into North and South. At a bird sanctuary on reclaimed brownfield land, a young man performs a meditative dance inspired by the movements of cranes, while a woman peers through a set of binoculars at the intrusion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Meanwhile, across the ocean, tourists look out from an observation deck at the demilitarized zone, or the DMZ, that has become a wildlife sanctuary over time. Grainy footage from a North Korean film produced in the 1990s is woven between images of these two places. Um, so here we will take a moment to watch a, the short um, excerpt of this video that's available on the artist's website.
need to unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> this clip illustrates a visual language Yoon has been continuing to develop over the past few years. Abstract forms, often directed at the landscape, captured with a handheld device that she repeatedly shakes. Her play with abstraction in the context of photography and video has evolved from her focus on rethinking the functions of the camera, undermining its use as a representational tool by conveying the unseen. Experimental camera techniques enable Yoon to give shape to time's residual qualities, imagining that it moves along a vertical axis rather than along the horizontal line we have come to expect. Through a vertical axis, moments in time become sediments, layered and synced with each other, and stories are carried from one environment to another, creating a palimpsest of relations across space. Okay, hold on one sec. Here we go. Dreaming Birds moves through the many emotional sediments of war and migration, lingering on moments that preoccupy the mind, that mark the body, and that shape environments and ecosystems. The film interwoven throughout tells the story of a North Korean ornithologist separated from his family by the DMZ. He feels the passage of time through his longing to reunite with his family and through the birds he studies, who naturally disregard man-made barriers to carry secret letters back and forth across the divided state. Ripped from a VHS tape, the degraded film is an abstracting tool that unearths disconnections between how the Korean War is commonly remembered as a quote unquote drawn out action, slowly inching toward a conclusion, in other words, reconciliation between North Korea and South Korea, and the quote unquote bodily ontologies of diasporic remembrance. According to scholar Crystal Moon uh, Hee Bayek, the, the Korean War is quote unquote re-encountered by diasporic subjects in the everyday. It surfaces through family relationships, in immigration policies, uh, and as Korean-made products and media packaged for consumption by global audiences. The film's grainy visuals appear to us as this kind of quotidian artifact from the past, making this history of war and longing feel distant. And yet, by juxtaposing this footage with crisp 4K cinematic camera work, Yoon gives form to re-encountered modes of survival and instances of resurgence that refuse linear narratives of progress. Yoon's vertical sense of time is a key part of her body of work, which often reflects upon diasporic identities, inherited histories, and the endurance of the landscape within and between different places in North America and East Asia. Along with Yoon's abstract camera work and her editing methods, such as splicing together media of contrasting quality, Common formal devices found across the artist's body of work include subjects that gaze at the viewer, at their surroundings, or at each other, and unconventional camera angles that topple the pictorial space, emphasizing altered sight lines and highlighting repressed or hidden knowledge systems. Specific landmarks and gestures surface repeatedly as forms evoking an, ineff an ineffable or evoking the ineffable ways that the land and the body hold and carry time. For instance, the act of looking in Yoon's Longview project is juxtaposed with the form of a sand mound that harkens back to a number of rituals um, commemorating families and environments. This series of six photographs, which was also produced as a set of postcards, as you can see on the slide here, as well, um, the, these um, two works were also accompanied by a video. Um, this was all shot on Long Beach in Pacific Rim National Park Reserve which is part of the traditional territory of the Nukanolk First Nations and one of the most westerly points on Vancouver Island. Yoon's Longview project is the culmination of a year-long study of the national park and its trans-Pacific entanglements. The photo and postcard series is bookended by the image of the artist gazing through a pair of binoculars and by the blurry silhouette of a figure dressed head to toe in black lycra. The lycra-clad figure appears throughout this suite of photographs performing a number of gestures, standing in a stiff, upright pose while gazing at the waves crashing along the shore, digging a hole in the sand, and standing inside the hole with their head minimized by the low horizon line and the expanse of the Pacific Ocean. In the fifth photograph, the figure is mysteriously absent. Only the hole and the sand mound remain. 
In the grand scale of geological time, the hole and the sand mound are temporary landmarks, short blips suggesting interference with the land, for when the tide comes in, both forms will wash away and return to the sea. However, on the more intimate register of familial time, these forms prolong earthly links between those who have passed and those who will come. Yun's sand mound bears a resemblance to ancestral graves that dot landscapes located in Korea. The example here pictures how these overgrown plots are lovingly cared for by family members who tend the weeds and leave offerings like flowers, food, and soju. Burial mounds in Korea give shape to time's verticality. More than simply resting places, they are ritual spaces constituted by family memories, stories, and care. Environs where those who have passed can continue to participate in the present by intervening in the cultivation of the land and its vital energy flows. Situated on the sandy shores of Long Beach, the mound in Longview syncs these commemorative practices in Korea with commemorative practices on Vancouver Island that have been disturbed and removed by the colonization and militarization of the West Coast. The sand mound recalls burial caves, rock shelters, and shell middens, which were once common features of the landscape across the Salish Sea. This forum highlights the significance of these sites to the indigenous heritage of the West Coast, while also repairing the rifts in time caused by their erasure. Now let's continue focus on the figure dressed in black lycra, which is yet another form that is repeated across many of Yoon's works. Portrayed by the artist, this figure derives in part from Yoon's interest in examining, quote, the body as a sign in specific sociocultural contexts and staging how um, identifications and identities assigned to the body radically shift as it moves through and occupies different times and spaces. Donning unisex clothing, the artist resists racialized and gendered images of Asian bodies in Western media, images that stereotype them either as enemies of war or as highly sexualized hyperfeminine victims. The artist instead renders herself almost like a blank slate, a seemingly unmarked time being navigating her surroundings. Yoon's time being appears in many of her works as a presence that punctures the pictorial space, dredging up hidden histories and forging new ways to relate and to remember. As it is becoming, uh, so the, the image of uh, the video uh, here follows this figure as it crawls through a number of sites in Seoul, which is the artist's place of birth. Wide camera angles emphasize the figure's travel through indoor shopping centers and crowded streets bustling with tourists and business people and through quiet alleyways and residential streets. The artist drags her body along the pavement, supporting herself with a wheeled platform reminiscent of those used to transport infirm, infirmed and injured bodies during the Korean War. Yoon's movements are slow and deliberate, punctuated by the squeaky and jerky sounds of the platform and her heavy labored breathing. Many bystanders pass her by without making eye contact, while some sneak furtive glances, trying to make sense of her gestures and her appearance. Yoon refers to this series of videos as lateral explorations, bodily experiments that confront the collective forgetting instigated by post-war reconstruction projects focused primarily on capitalist growth and national restructuring. Many of the sites in this series were selected because they carry meaning despite appearing rather unremarkable on the surface. For example, in one of the video loops, Yoon travels through a site in the Itaewon district, formerly referred to as Hooker Hill. Hooker Hill is enmeshed within Korea's colonial and wartime history as a, place within, as a place where Japanese and American soldiers sought out relations with comfort women, unmarried women and girls who were forced to perform sexual labor. The comfort woman, in fact, is a shady figure located at the edges of national memory. In the immediate post-war eras, many former comfort women did not disclose their experiences for fear of living with the shame of being coerced into sexual relationships outside of marriage. While they gained unprecedented visibility in the early 1990s, in part due to the very public testimony of three courageous survivors, redress has become a protracted struggle. More testimonies by surviving women um, have been repeatedly ignored 
and government officials, especially in Japan, work to absolve themselves from involvement in the issue. Many more survivors who have come to be affectionately referred to as, as halmoni or grandmothers have become visible through the efforts of activist organizations committed to addressing their trauma as an integral part of post-colonial memory and reconciliation. So moving laterally through Seoul, Yoon re-encounters his, these historical consciousnesses uh, by scrawling her own embodied traces of memory onto an urban topography loaded with personal and political histories. A landscape that has undergone immense change in the decades since her birth and her family's immigration. The pictorial space reflects her first memories of the city as a geography flattened by war, precarity, and ideological conflict. By altering the cityscape, displaying it in the gallery, as you see here on screens that are angled up to the viewer from the ground, the artist highlights the rigorous labor needed for remembrance work that upends state agendas, obscuring history's verticality, uh, for um, obscuring the many returns, and the complications that arise as we continue to meander through the rubble. From movement to rest, here Yoon explores interrelated concepts of place and belonging, imagining the intimate scales of familial time entangled with the long durée of geological time. The artist is pictured supported by her children as they stand in front of a 125-year-old Mirabelle plum tree. While no, while no longer producing fruit, the tree remains an integral part of the ecosystem, physically su supporting both human and non-human worlds. Taken near her family's place on Hornby Island, the photograph recalls how time is felt through the relationships between parents and their children. Indeed, parenthood can be experienced on its own vertical axis in the ways in which parents recall and re-encounter different layers of their children's personalities and appearances as they age. When our children are young, we often measure time in milestones, which can happen suddenly, like the first time your baby laughs, or gradually, like one day you realize that, that you no longer need to support your baby's neck while carrying them. They start to steady themselves, relying on you less and less. Parents, in turn, often rely on their children more as they age. Uh, so Yoon situates this intergenerational bond within a site that carries meaning for her and her family. And in the process, the landscape becomes a testimonial object, bearing witness to how we, as memory studies scholar um, Marianne Hirsch suggests, quote, inherit not only stories and images from the past, but also our bodily and affective relationship to the world we inhabit. The triad formed between Yoon, her son, and her daughter is enshrined within a landscape in the midst of overtaking them, a sign that they inhabit a space marked by dynamic processes of transition and change. While Yoon connects her children to inherited histories of wartime trauma, the landscape unfold, unfolds them within cycles of regrowth. Connecting past and present, here and there, rest suggests that the histories we inherit do not foreclose the ability to reimagine a future. Yoon examines further the interconnect, interconnected registers of geological and familial time in living time, a series of six diptychs featuring a number of her loved ones, family members and friends who are photographed in different landscapes around Hornby Island. The first diptych in the series pictures Yoon's friend Anne, who is a longtime resident of Hornby Island. Anne positions herself next to a massive arbutus tree standing next to it in the first frame and lying beside it in the second. The tree's leaning trunk bends and twists, splintering into a number of crooked branches. Usually located within eight kilometers of seawater, although they can also thrive further inland, arbutus trees are known for their hardiness, their ability to resist gale force winds and pounding ocean waves, and they can live, um, they can live for up to 400 years. Their reliance on salt water links them to other Pacific ecologies. Thus, the arbutus tree serves as a poignant visual for Yoon to reimagine the connective qualities of the Pacific Ocean beyond those informed by commerce and colonization. And like in rest, living time thinks through how the land supports human activity. The bodies of Yoon's subjects are minimized by elements in the landscape a visual strategy that brings into relief the, rel the relative smallness of human life 
as seen through a planetary scope. The subjects in these photographs position their bodies with these relationships in mind. Standing suggests solidarity with the non-human world, while lying down next to the tree's roots evokes inter interdependency and acknowledges the tree and the earth as sources of life. Thinking through interdependence is crucial for repairing relationships between human and non-human actors. Interdependence also foregrounds the urgency to engage ethically with the histories and knowledge systems of lands and peoples experience, experiencing trauma. Yoon's two-part video series, Other Hauntings, resists conventional methods typically used to shine a light on the degradation of the land, instead employing a number of experimental techniques to picture how environmental concerns resonate across time and space. The videos are set on Jeju-do, uh, which is an island province in South Korea, which has um, long is long considered culturally distinct from the mainland of the peninsula. Jeju has become a popular tourist destination after it was recognized as a World Heritage Site in 2007. Um, it's known primarily for its semi-tropical forests, coastlines dotted with waterfalls, and quote unquote, the longest lava tube in the world, South Korea's official tourism organization depicts Jeju as an island full of wonders. Other hauntings centers on Gurumbi, uh, a sacred and ecologically sensitive coastal lava rock that while integral to the island's ecosystem has been endangered by commercial development and military intervention. Once occupying 1.2 kilometers of the coast, Gurumbi now consists of only a narrow strip of rock wedged between a beachfront resort and the Jeju Naval Base. Completed in 2016, the base is an outpost for the South Korean military. However, warships from Canada and from the United States also dock there. And it also serves as a port for cruise ships, emphasizing the deep ties between the military and tourist economies. This series was produced in consultation with activists in Jeju who have spent more than a decade resisting the threat of militarization and environmental loss. Mapping community memories and rituals, Yoon's camera builds an image of Gurumbi through embodied encounters, a method of image making that resists the consumptive and extractive logics of her medium. The first part, dance, focuses on Tara, a former professional dancer who once performed a sacred dance on Gurumbi's surface. Tara uses her entire body to map the rock formation from memory. Her gestures are graceful and purposeful, punctuating her speech to convey Gurumbi's significance as a source of life and a site where Jeju's histories and syncretic belief systems become part of the landscape. As Tara speaks, a number of things shift in her environment. Yoon's camera, which is mounted on a wobbly tripod, stutters in the wind, giving form to subtle shaking movements that can be seen around the edges of the video frame. These movements help the viewer experience Tara's environment by conveying what cannot be seen. And the, present, the presence of the wind accents Gurumbi's absence and renders knowledge of this landmark. The subtle touch of the camera becomes a visual strategy for detailing loss without having to lay it bare. Along with the appearance of the wind, midway through the video, a ghostly figure dressed in army fatigues with seaweed in its hair enters the frame and begins to slowly eclipse Tara and mimic her actions. Yet this presence never completely lines up with Tara's body. Its actions are always slightly delayed and Tara's voice can still be heard. This presence slowly starts to vanish once Tara begins to perform Gurumbi's future. The figure's visual non-alignment works to highlight the complicated entanglements between Jeju's militarization and its effects on the local, on the local community. These entanglements form a palimpsest, each additional layer of knowledge and experience, each, each action and utterance bears traces of the island's past that directly affect those in the present working to ensure its future. While other ha hauntings dance gives Gurumbi a form through Tara's gestures, other hauntings song provides Gurumbi with a voice. 
The two parts reflect how activists on Jeju understand the island's overlapping senses of geological and historical time through their care for the sacred rock. Song opens with a montage of blurry footage captured with Yoon's handheld camera. Birds chirp as a lush forest trail comes into focus. The camera then follows a young man as he ambles along the trail, encountering tourists and wildlife along the way. This scene is momentarily interrupted by a wide panning shot of a nearby beachfront resort as the cam and the where the camera lingers on resort workers and guests walking through manicured gardens and along a paved driveway. The young man is then seen again at the, ed at the end of the path approaching the coastline. He rests at the ocean's edge and produces a long hollow tube made from construction pipe, positioning it beneath the water's surface. Through the tube, he sings directly to the remaining parts of Gurumbi. His song is one of protest, echoing a ritual performed by Father Moon, a Catholic priest and local activist um, who, has, who is a leading voice in the protests against uh, foreign military presence in South Korea and positions himself every day outside the entrance to the Jeju Naval Base, singing a song that repeats the phrase, peace, Ganjiang, Gurumbi, our love. Here, the young man redirects Father Moon's song to Gurumbi itself. The viewer hears only the warbled sounds of the young man's breath submerged under the water, as if the lyrics are meant to become embedded with the rock. As the young man sings to Gurumbi, Yoon records his surroundings. Panning toward the horizon, her camera zooms in on a warship to, um, as it slowly approaches the heavily guarded port. Warships, coastal surveillance towers, and soldiers on lookout appear in a number of Yoon's works as visual reminders of systemic militarization and nation building, linking Korea's past to its present, um, to its present constructed sense of place constituted by decolonial struggle, national partition, and continuous Cold War. On Jeju, this imagery unearths devastating memories of the 1948 massacre, which was an event that caused the deaths of up to an estimated 30,000 civilians as a result of a counterinsurgency launched to quell communist support on the island. The violence committed against Jeju's residents is often discussed as an unavoidable military action that helped halt the spread of communism in Asia. Likewise, the new state-of-the-art naval base is perceived as a necessary security measure for safeguarding the Korea Strait against China's economic interests in the area and from North Korean aggression. So as Yoon casts her camera's gaze at these forms linking Jeju's past and present struggle, the young man's warbled song continues to punctuate the pictorial space, instigating a sequence of experimental imagery. Yoon's jostling camera produces long vertical lines of uh, strands of light that leap from Jeju's rocky coast, merging the still visible parts of Gurumbi with the blue sky. Through this blurring effect, Yoon imagines that Gurumbi is speaking back, responding both to Father Moon's song and to the warships that are encroaching in the distance. Like in Dreaming Birds, Yoon's abstract imagery upends dimensions of time as progressive and inevitable to instead lay bare Jeju's many historical sediments. Other Hauntings devises a visual language for grounding a relational experience of history and the landscape. So here we are back at Dreaming Birds, um, contrasting and overlapping, and overlapping actions and imagery taking place simultaneously here and there, now and then, Yoon's image-based body of work gives shape to time's verticality, its residual rhythms that bend, twist, and meet at intersecting points. Yoon brings about this image of time through her use of experimental techniques. Abstract imagery enables the artist to push the camera to facilitate deeper investigations of diasporic histories and subjectivities and their relationships to landscape, without reproducing harmful terms of representation, appropriation, and extraction. Meanwhile, specific landmarks, gestures, and imagery repeated throughout her works highlight relationships and resonances across time and space and between human and non-human worlds. In this way, Yoon's works push back against her chronology conditioned by narratives of progress and a desire to belong to a world where violence is relegated to a distant past. 
by unfolding multiple senses of how we experience and feel time through family, through historical consciousness, and through the environment, the artist foregrounds image making as an embodied practice of relation making. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. That was fantastic and so oh, interesting. <laughs> Um, and we already have questions coming in, which is fantastic. Okay. Um, so our first question is from Chero Neville. She says, your focus on the idea of time is so important. The way that places, urban and natural, contain histories of trauma is apparent throughout Jinmi's early work and most recent work. Thinking about her use of water in so many works, the unintended preservation of nature at the DMZ, or the scale of the bodies in relation to the trees and living time. Do you think we could read a hopeful message in Jinmi's recent work, suggesting the power of nature to transcend human activity and historic environmental trauma? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I do think that there is some element of hope in many of her um, more recent works. Um, I, I don't, I, I think that she, but she, in, she's hopeful, but also in a sense that she's not looking to um, I guess, forget the past or to forget these, that these traumas happened. Um, I like to think about, um, a recent work by theorist Aisha, Ar Ar Ariella Aisha Azule, um, called Potential History, where she talks about kind of how, um, we, not, not necessarily resisting these, um, chronologies of colonialism and, um, capitalism, these things that have created, have destroyed the planet and have destroyed people's um, livelihoods, essentially their world, world destroyers. Um, it's not necessarily a practice of, re of sort of moving on from these history mm -hmm. or moving on from this trauma and rethinking ways to or new strategies of overcoming them, but rather understanding how they are carried and embodied and, but with a sense that we can still sort of this sense of remembrance is still necessary for working through them. Um, so in effect, I, I do, I, I see that in Yoon, in a lot of Yoon's works too. I don't think she's necessarily, um, I don't think that she's saying that we are completely at a loss for, um, you know, at a, yeah, at a loss. It, it's just, a, it's all kind of part of this understanding of, um, time on this vertical axis, everything is sort of related to each other and it bleeds into each other and it's carried forward. Yeah, I love the way that Jinmi speaks about time. Um, well, Chero responds, thank you. I think what I'm seeing is that humans are irrelevant and the planet will survive after us. <laughs> Let's hope, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, Chero's comment actually reminds me of, um, I, I wish I could credit where I heard this, but it was maybe even in a, a kid's TV show that my daughter was watching, but saying, um, you know, people talk about saving the planet. You're not trying to save the planet. You're trying to save humanity. The planet will be here long after us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, one of the, the expressions that, that Jinmi used um, when I was speaking to her about this exhibition was describing time as threads that, hang down and sway and touch mm, mm -hmm. and I just yeah I find Jimmy's handling of the concept of time to be so evocative and and helpful in thinking through these really big ideas and and how we can move forward as as humans and in relation to each other with and in relation with non-human living beings yeah absolutely um that kind of, and it it shows also too that she is really thinking through, I know that she's informed a lot by um, more indigenous concepts, uh, mm -hmm. uh, philosophies of time and the environment and the interrelations between the human and non-human worlds. And it shows how she sort of, I know she works through a lot of her own relationship to these um, philosophies and how it's not for her, she's not looking to appropriate them or absorb them in any way, but to, to find a way to speak with them or alongside mm. them rather, and to, um, you know, yeah, tease out these relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so like, for example, with the, I was, when I was talking about the mound, um, the, the sand mound and how it reflect, how it sort of 
resembles burial mounds in Korea, as well as mounds that exist other places in the world, particularly on the West Coast, it's, it's kind of through these sort of resonant imagery that she finds ways to connect. Mm -hmm. um, and so looking at very culturally specific forms, but also how these culturally specific forms do resonate when mm -hmm. uh, in different places. Yeah. Uh, there was a there was an expression that you used um, when talking about the artwork as it is becoming that I've mm -hmm. I used the expression time being yeah <laughs> so evocative and I it's not a way of describing Jimmy and that work that I've heard anybody else use I wonder if you wouldn't mind expanding on it a little bit um, so time being is a concept. I'm not going to do it any justice here, but it <laughs> it's it's related to um, Zen philosophies. Okay, there's a whole um, notion of time being um, that is part of like this sort of Buddhist Zen um, milieu, and it's also kind of related to um, being in time, like the high, like the Heideggerian phenomenology. Um, okay. There's some scholarship that's been done that's linked to those two because they're very culturally specific concepts of what it means to embody time and to be in the world. Um, and so I kind of took that term um, to think about this kind of relationship to time um, mm -hmm. and how this figure here, from what I gather, it comes from a lot, some of her works in the early 2000s where she was thinking through how um, how the body carries, you know, specific racialized and gendered markers and how she wanted to kind of resist that. Um, and so she, she goes back, she, so she dresses all in black and so to embody this sort of figure that moves between times and spaces yeah. um, and, and tries to resist being read in a particular way. Um, so I, yeah, that's a, not a, the best answer to that question, that was but great. I, I really, it's really, I would, yeah, definitely, if you're interested in that concept, it, it, I would recommend reading some, looking into some, I guess, Zen philosophy where time being comes from, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I've so appreciated what you shared with us today. I, I really love thinking through Jin Mi's work in these ways, and, you know, you've really, you've been so generous with these ideas. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. <laughs> I have one more question here. Do you have time for one more? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, so this is from EJ oh. McGillis. Oh, hi, EJ. <laughs> <laughs> so EJ says, thank you so much for your inspiring lecture. Building on Chero's comments and question, I find her way of incorporating human time and non-human time as one way of embedding her and many other diasporic experiences in the midst of time and place as well as a way of giving us some hope to cohabit and navigate this world together. Mm -hmm. Would you speak more about this human and non-human relationship in our work? Thank you so much, Victoria. Mm, yeah, thank you, EJ. Um, EJ is a dear friend of mine who always pushes me, <laughs> challenges me um, to, to rethink these things all the time. Um, speak more about this. Yeah, so I, I do, I think that this really comes through in the way that quite often she situates um, her subjects in the landscape. Um, for example, in living time, these they're they are very the, their bodies are quite minimized and really it's really the environment around them that is sort of the the major presence in the image. Um, and so, in that sense, kind of I think I mentioned about how when you think about um, human relationships to the non-human world through this more planetary scope, you realize just how tiny we really are in comparison. And so she's always sort of playing around with scale, I think, in this way, um, thinking and thinking more about, uh, thinking more critically about how we sort of inhabit this world and how we share it with other um, sort of non-human actors such as trees and, and, and also too, a lot of these natural landmarks are really important imagery in her work. So they evoke different things. Um, so the Arbutus tree is a wonderful example. Um, I remember talking to her about why she um, was interested in this, this specific tree, um, because it also plays a role in her 
um, living time video. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the video was part of the exhibition or not. I kind of pulled image uh, works that I could see from the uh, installation shots of the exhibition. So I knew that they were in the exhibition. Um, so in the Living Time video, the Arbutus tree plays a really important role. Um, it's a spot where Aunt, her friend Anne um, and her daughter are these sort of figures that are mirroring each other through different times and spaces, uh, different times on Hornby Island. And they both sort of encounter the tree in their travels in the in the video, um, but in totally different times. And the idea is that we are kind of following through, following, following them through how their gestures are mirroring each other, um, and that cr brings about a sense of a relationship between the two figures, but a relationship that is quite vague. So we don't really know if this is meant to be the same person in different stages of her life, or if it's just two different people. Um, if, with no relationship to each other at all. They just happen to be in this place at different times. Um, so the Arbutus tree there is kind of like this important landmark. And because it has this um, connection and reliance on salt water, um, she state, she, I remember her telling me that it, it really is one of those um, images that she thinks um, she uses to connect to other places beyond Hornby. Uh, and to think about, um, really, her work is about the relationships between different geographies located along the so-called Pacific Rim. And so the Arbutus tree is one of those, is one of those imageries that kind of helps bring about those connections, but in a very poet, more poetic and abstract way. It's not necessarily like throwing it in your face that this is about Pacific tra or trans-Pacific relationships. Hmm. Yeah, I love thinking about uh, the nature that we surround ourselves with and, and the kind of uh, storytelling that can be involved in that as well, right? <laughs> uh, EJ says, thank you so much for your lecture, Victoria. <laughs> oh, thank you, EJ. Thank you, thank you for, <laughs> for <laughs> attending. <laughs> You're sweet. Um, so again, thank you so much for today. Um, we are recording this event and we'll get it up on our website uh, probably in about a week. Okay. Um, so please feel free to share with anybody who was unable to attend today. Um, and uh, Jin Mi Yoon uh, uh, here elsewhere, Other Hauntings continues in the Kamloops Art Gallery uh, until uh, this Saturday. Saturday is the last day to see it. So anybody who's local, please come on down and see it before we have to take it down. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.